the book of Mark, so that means this week we are probably going to continue in the book of Mark. So let's go ahead and go over there to the sixth chapter, and uh, that one was quite long. So we almost finished up. We left off with the, uh, the miracle, or what we call the shared miracle, where they were a part of what Jesus was multiplying. Remember the, the uh, blessed, broken, and multiplied. All right, this week uh, we're going to start off in, uh, in verse 53. What's that? Six. Verse 56? Oh. Chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, chapter 6. You're right. I need... I. Uh, Borrow somebody else's Bible now. I need definitely need my glasses for that. <laughs> Isn't it great you go to the dollar store and get dollar glasses? Because you know you're always going to leave them somewhere or break them or sit on them or something. So unless you wear them all the time. So this is great. You can just grab some cheaters for a buck. All right. Um, let's go over to Mark. And Fred tells me we're in the sixth chapter. Which verse again? 53. Right All right. So in verses, uh, we're going to read just quickly verses 53 through 56. And uh, so read along with me in whatever version you have. It says, So they crossed over, um, and they came to the land of the Gennesaret and beached the boat. Let me see what version I'm looking at. Cause... Then they hurried throughout the vicinity and began to carry the sick that uh, on the mats to, whoever, to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he would go, into the villages, the towns, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might touch just the tassel of his robe, and everyone who touched it was made whole. Now, does anyone remember earlier on that this is uh, pretty indicative of the scenario that happened with the lady with the issue of blood? Remember that? So I thought I'd take the opportunity to kind of expound on that. We, we talked about the lady with the issue of blood, and we're going to kind of move back and forth between the multitude of people who had followed him here and did the same thing she did. And we would have to presume, whoops, maybe it ran out. There we go. Okay. Check one, two. Is it on? Yep. As far as, can you turn the volume up so I can actually hear that it's on? Check, check one, two, good. All right, so we're, maybe a little less. So we're going back and forth between these two experiences to fill in the blanks. Uh, obviously, uh, whenever you hear something, uh, an experience from someone else, doesn't it give you confidence that you too might be able to experience that when it comes to, let's say, a testimony that somebody's heard about God's healing power or his provision or something? It, it kind of boosts your confidence that it, the same God who ministered to them would do the same thing for you. Right. So apparently story got out word got out about the woman who touched the hem of his garment. Now you and I, we, we're wearing clothes today. The hem of our garment is not very impressive. Is it? It's just the, the, basically the bottom of it that keeps it from unraveling everywhere you go. Well, uh, in his day, Jesus' day, let me just kind of touch base. Maybe you're familiar with culture. Maybe you're just familiar. Maybe you've been shared with some of these things before. But I thought I would, I would give you a little insight. Uh, I have some friends who... who, who uh, kind of did some study on this as well, and it caused them to want to change some of the ways that they look at things. So I thought maybe it'd be helpful for us too. The hem of the garment uh, would have been the bottom of, of what at that time would have been called a cloak. If you remember, like a uh, like when Elijah and Elisha were the prophets were together, and you remember that uh, that the cloak from Elijah fell. And Elisha was able to take that cloak upon him and then do the miraculous works that the prophet had done beforehand. Right. It was like a transfer of the anointing from one prophet to the other prophet. 
Well, that cloak would have been a common uh, piece of garment for uh, people, especially in the older covenant. Now, in the newer covenant, you had what would be, and even today maybe, would be called like a prayer shawl. And uh, this would be what, what you would call a tent. Now, some people have had uh, differing opinions of Paul as a tent maker, whether he was actually a person who made these prayer shawls or whether he was actually a person that made tents. I, I'm not going to go there because I went there and I don't really know. But I can say when Jesus would say, you know, go inside your closet where and pray there where your father who sees in secret would reward you openly. The idea was is a prayer shawl kind of just blocks out the whole rest of the world, what's going on, and allows you to be intimate and alone with God wherever you are. So it's really a pretty awesome thing in the culture to have that kind of an awareness that you could just stop what you're doing wherever you are. You could just put that over your head, and basically it's just alone time for you and God. So you could do that maybe like this. I don't know. <laughs> I may look a little weird out there. But uh, in, 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 in his time, it was, it was a cultural thing, and the, the shawl would have, or, or in the older version, uh, either way, the cloak would have a four corners, and on the four corners would be what we would call a tassel. Now, when you and I go decorate our home, and we put tassels on things, or you go to one of those foo-foo decorated hotels, you know, and they got tassels on things, that's not quite what we're really thinking of. This would be uh, something, maybe you've seen prayer shawls with the long pieces of string hanging off of them. And in this case, the, uh, the longest of those strings would have been a, a, a woven part that had about 613 knots in it. And each one of those knots represented 613 commandments of Moses. So many thou shalt knots and so many thou shalt. Mm -hmm. was, uh, all the 613 commandments of the Lord. So that would kind of always remind them. Now, if you think of yourself as wearing a shawl or a cloak, you know, something over yourself, either over this way or over this way, the four corners would mean you have it in front of you and you have it behind you. So these long trailing, uh, if you will, rows of knots, you know, they could be woven and so forth, but they were basically longer and they stuck out for you to see and for everyone else to see so that people would know hey, that's somebody that's godly, you know, and uh, it would speak, it would separate them, you know, from others around them and so forth. And it was always a constant reminder of the laws of God, both before you and behind you. In other words, the things that you're supposed to be moving towards and the things that you're supposed to leave behind <laughs> so that people would both coming and going, it would be in their mindset that not only am I coming into this with God's laws and his ways in mind. I'm also trying to leave others, you know, with God's laws and God's ways in my wake, if you will. So with that, you see Jesus kind of walking through at, with a covering or a prayer shawl or however you want to put it. And then these, what's called, uh, and my Hebrew is not anything. So I can just say it the way it looks at it. But it's called zitzit, which it's easy to remember, but really a weird name. Anyway, it's called a zitzit, and uh, today you can see if you looked up zitzit, uh, it's, it's got a T on the very front of it, and then a Z, so it's kind of like, don't try to spell it zit, zit, it's a zit, zit. Anyway, I don't know if the T is silent. But today you could look at it, and they basically, it can be pretty much just an ornament. It's uh, not the same. It can be a passion statement as well as a statement of faith, you know. And then there are some that it looks pretty authentic and others it just kind of looks like a long piece of uh, string hanging down, you know. And so it can be either one. But I think that, uh, that what it really speaks to is the scriptures tell us that the laws of God are written in our hearts. Now this was, in other words, in a day when there was no new, new birth available, you could have this zits it to kind of help keep you in mind of all the laws of God, you know. But today, you know, you have new birth. You have the Holy Spirit who's, who's written the laws of God on your hearts so that you could still wear a zits it. One fellow said that it's like, uh, it's kind of like tying a Bible on the end of the rope. I mean, it's, it's kind of like to remind you of everything, uh, you know, make it obvious to you, but it, it it's really an internal thing. 
and sometimes I know that we, you know, we we put Christian bumper stickers on the back of our cars. You know, we do other things other than zit zits to uh, to be an uh, expression of us to remind us about what we should be doing, how we should be living, and everything. Uh, or big giant cross or something like this. You know, to kind of demonstrate our faith. That was the demonstration of their faith. But now today, it's more of an internal thing, isn't it? And none, none of the things, and I'm sure you've been aware of it, 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 it just kind of grates on you when somebody's like wearing all the right Christian stuff or they got it all around their house or they got the big family Bible sitting on the middle of the table. And yet they'll come, at, come out with all the most outrageous kind of speech and language and, and lifestyle. And you're like, I don't get this. There's something, something wrong with you know, the signals you're sending, but the the life you're living. And in this case, the goal is th that we would have a spirit-led life and that we would live by the laws of God that are written in our hearts and that's only available through new birth. All the rest of that, no matter how you dress it up, it's not going to suffice. Now, in Jesus' case, you see here that it said, as many as touched the hem of his garment were made whole. Now, you remember in the woman's case that and we, we kind of put over uh, that part of the chapter a title that said, you know, uh, faith makes the difference. Remember that? Faith makes the difference. And faith made the difference for her because there were just so many people. Now, Jesus is flowing, is, is going through a crowd of people. You remember the scenario in the past. The disciples asked, he said, who touched me? The disciples said, why do you ask who touches you? Basically, because everybody's there. And then you, you can see Jesus with either this cloak or this prayer shawl and it's flowing somewhat near him and everything, and then people are just trying to grab onto the zitzit, this, this exhibition of, of godliness. They're trying to touch it, and when somebody touches it, this woman in particular got healed. And now, again, he said it was faith, not even her, not even us uh, coming to that conclusion. She said, I mean, he said that to her. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. I mean, that, so we know that she made a connection that others did not. So we could say that story got out, and as that story got out, it produced faith in others who literally brought folks all around, and then they too could reach out and touch this zitzit that's on the back of the, uh, the prayer cloth or the cloak that he was wearing. So now, uh, I thought it was really interesting to notice that, you know, this woman, uh, she stretched out in the press of in the multitude of people and she felt like she could at least it says according to what we read earlier that if she for she said in herself if i could but touch the hem of his clothes the hem of his garment i would be whole so she had made that proclamation within herself but the amazing thing is in order to touch somebody's clothes when they're flowing behind you and even at that with a long thread you can be three, four feet away from a person and still touch those parts of them without them even knowing that you've even touched them. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And yet Jesus, even though she only had the faith to reach out and to touch the hem of his garment, he turned around with a statement that is life-changing and says, who touched me? In other words... Whenever we feel like we're making a connection with God in faith, sometimes we feel like it's a distant connection, don't we? We don't feel like it's some intimate, you know, experience. We're like stepping out in faith. We're overriding our feelings and sometimes our emotions to do what we know God said we could do if we would believe. And even though it seems distant, like she touched this external part of Jesus, he says, look, when I see somebody reaching out in faith and touching me with an ex what they consider to be an external touch, he says, I see that as a personal touch. In other words, it literally touches God when we reach out by faith towards him. He considers that, and that's his words, who touched me. Amen? Mm -hmm. So it's touching to God when we reach out by faith. You know, a lot of times we consider it just... Unconnect, disconnected, but it's not. It is what touches God. That's what he says so himself. So even though the woman felt she could only come close to him, because for whatever reason, sometimes we don't feel like we can really approach God. You know, we feel like our own sin or 
the thing that we didn't do lately, the shortcoming that we had, keeps us at a distance from God, but stretching out in faith towards Him. Nonetheless, in spite of, He finds that touching, and He turns to her and says, Who touched you? Now, however we reach out to Jesus, He's touched. Okay? I want you to hear that. However we reach out to Jesus in faith, He is touched by that. It speaks to Him. And He'll take full advantage of that and respond. I've got three R's in that. He responds, He recognizes, and He rewards those who make efforts of faith towards Him. I say the three R's because look at what He did with this woman. And again, it's only in parallel because we... We're not digressing because it happened again with a whole bunch of people. So it's very important that we get down what's happening here. And it, the three R's are, he responded to her. The first was, instead of just continuing on, he turned. He stopped and he turned and he said, who touched me? So he, he responds to us when we reach out in faith. The second, as he did for her. The second is, so he stopped by he stopped and he turned. The second is he recognized her. He recognized her publicly. Think about it. She didn't have any good reason to be out in public. She's weak. She's destitute. Now you remember the story. She's been suffering with something for years. Suffered many things of many positions. Was nothing better but rather grew worse. In other words, she... She not only would, did she have her initial problem, she had other problems that were caused by her, her trying to get help for the problem she, she first had. So she's in worse shape, you know, for having tried to get help, which is depressing. And so she's out there in the public, weak. It says she spent everything she had was nothing better. In other words, she was, she was spent. She was spent financially. Every way she could be, she was completely spent. But he turned to her with the second R, which is he recognized her. Instead of a faceless person who would just go behind and just touch him at a five or six foot distance, just to try and reach out in faith and just make that connection in some distant way, he turns, he recognizes her. How does he recognize her? He says, he calls her daughter. Remember, he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So he recognized her in two ways. First of all, he calls her daughter, not some insignificant speck who would just reach out to him and, and the best they could do is just touch the hem of his flowing garment. But he calls her a daughter, and then he recognizes her faith in a community and culture where faith is like the thing to be recognized for. And so he, he recognizes her. And the third R that he does with this scenario is that he rewarded her. He rewarded her. So the first one was that he responded. So when we reach out to faith, in, to God in faith, he responds. The second is he recognizes us. We're taken from a, what other position we could never have otherwise achieved, but God raises us up. And then he, the third R is he rewards us. How did he reward her? Well, here's an interesting thing. He says, daughter, go in peace. You're healed of your plague. You're whole. In other words, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Okay? Now, whole is a lot better than just healed. Okay? Whole is a lot better than healed. Healed can still leave you broke. Healed can still leave you hurt. But whole is a, is a different ballgame. And I like that because what it does is it means that everything from her life had changed from that point on. Not only was she healed, but now she could go back out in public and not feel like she, would, she should be ashamed or embarrassed by her own condition. She could go back out in public and feel good that she had been given a, a, a response from Jesus that now her community recognized her as a daughter of God and as a faithful person. How, how does that change the scenario of somebody 
who was just barely able to eke out enough to touch him, to be rewarded, to be made whole, to be restored. Those are all things that happen just by this one connection with God through faith. And then, of course, she was rewarded in the sense that she could then go back out into the workforce and instead of staying poor and not having any way of providing for herself, she could go do the things that she wanted to do in life again. Not only that, but she probably wasn't high on the, on the list of people that others wanted to know or that had hope of good relationships. She's broke and sick. But when Jesus responded and rewarded, he rewarded her, making her whole, giving her hope for the life that she otherwise could never have had. Amen? Amen. And this is what Jesus did for this multitude as they reached out, they, they heard the story, they saw the woman, they saw the new life that she was given, not just the, that personal experience of healing, but the wholeness that followed. And they saw that and said, we want others, not only do we want to receive, but we want, it says they brought other people there. We want others to know this wholeness. Amen? Now I got a question for you just before we go on. Is that some of you have been healed from things in your bodies. And you know, sometimes we get focused on what we need healing. I also want to encourage you to go for wholeness. You know? Because when you're made whole, then you want to share that wholeness with others. And you want to bring people into that place where they too can know wholeness. So I would ask you, in spite of all of the things that you aren't or don't have, you know what? I still consider myself whole. I consider myself with the hope I never would have otherwise had. And sure, a lot of it's not manifest in my life yet, but I've never failed to have hope for all the things in my life that God has given me hope for. And for that reason, I think we can all share Jesus that he can make anyone whole. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sure, the woman still had to walk through the process of getting a job, finding a mate, and resuming a life. But the wholeness was in the hope that she had. Jesus gave her. Amen? And that gives us all a reason to share Jesus because in spite of what we aren't, what we haven't got yet, we are a whole people. We no longer have a hole that only God could fill. Amen? Amen. All right, so financially and then, of course, spiritually she was made whole because she knew that faith made her whole and God himself had commended her faith. All right, let's look at uh, verses 1 through 9 real quick. All right, so here's a quick test. Are you ready? When they said that they touched the hem of Jesus' garment. What's the name of the thing that hangs down from your garment in the culture, in the Jewish culture? What's the name of it? Zitzit. Very good. There's also a little, a little side note that it had a blue thread that ran down through the middle of it, and uh, that blue was like the picture of royalty and wealth and so forth. And so Lydia, like in the book of Acts, where it says she was a seller of purple, it kind of said that she was a rich woman and that telling that story about Lydia was telling the story that the gospel was open to rich people and poor people alike and see someone very well off got born again right here in the ministry. So this quote is interesting. I didn't do enough study on it to bring much else to light. I think that by itself does encourage us. But let's look at uh, verses 1 through 9. It says, The Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come to Jerusalem gathered around him they observed that some of the disciples eating. Uh, they observed some of the disciples were eating uh, their bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. Now, how many times does your mama tell you, right? You're supposed to wash before you eat. Well, this is a little different. This is a this is uber washing, and we'll look at it just real quick. It says, for the Pharisees, in fact, all the Jews, 
uh, will not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, keeping with the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they are washed. And there are many other customs that they have received and keep, like washing of cups, jugs, copper utensils, and dining couches. When the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your, don't your disciples live according to traditions of the elders instead of eating bread with ritually unclean hands? Jesus answered and said, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching the doctrines and commands of men. Disregarding the commandment of God, you keep the traditions of men. He also said to them, You're completely, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whosoever speaks evil of your father and mother must be put to death. Now, so here's the thing. Washing hands is good. You know, I'm all for it. But this is a different kind of washing of the hands. And there's all kinds of like uh, commentary on just how... In, uh, into it they were when it comes to washing hands. You know, you pour so many times on the left hand, and then you you pour so many times on the right hand. And then, I, I figured that really wouldn't help us too much to know that. But I did kind of want to just say it's kind of like it became way too it became way too complicated, and it's kind of like the dog wagging the tail. I'm sorry, the tail wagging the dog, where the details mean more than the substance. And in this case, Jesus isn't down on washing hands. He's just saying, you can't let the tail wag the dog. You've got to let the, the whole be what's more important than the pieces. Amen? Amen. And so, I mean, I just thought about it. Uh, I happened to have looked it up because I know that a lot of God's laws, are they're good. They're, they're always good. They're good for you. So I just happened to look up, you know, how do you wash your hands? I know you think this is funny, but if you look up how to wash your hands, you'll find it's very interesting. They tell you how to wash your hands, how much soap and how long you're supposed to do it, even in today. Did you know that in order to wash your hands correctly today, you're supposed to be able to sing happy birthday twice <laughs> to wash your hands correctly? Now, I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with how that works, but I did try it, and I want to tell you, that's a long, Were your hands long clean? <laughs> time. I, don't, I, I think I'd have had to get a microscope out to order to identify it, but the idea is that, uh, you know, I, that's exactly what I want to do, while the guy, I can look in the mirror and see the guy in back of me rolling his eyes as I sing happy birthday to me twice over while I wash my hands. Eventually, I have seen that us gentlemen who go to the restroom, we want to get in there, we want to wash our hands and get out of there, and so much so that if somebody's taking too long to wash their hands, I've seen people just give up and walk away. I'm like, see there, not only have I done a bad thing, now I've encouraged a plague on the world. I've just released a man in there who now I've frustrated so much that he's not going to wash his hands. For that matter, there's 32 teeth in my mouth. And I figure I only take two minutes to wash those. Why should I spend that long to wash two hands? Anyway, here's the thing. We can ruin anything when we add our own, uh, what do you say, embellishments to God's word. Can't we? When we add our embellishments to the simplicity of God's word, it almost always removes the power of that word from God. So let me look at uh, verses 10 through 13, and we'll close with that. This is where Jesus gives an example, because he starts off by basically saying, look, you guys are all overboard on the hand-washing thing. Don't come down on my disciples, because that's all you're doing. You know, Yes, it did say in the scriptures that you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat, but that's now turned into an embellishment. Now they've made it more about the process than they have about the Word of God. People should wash their hands not because it was 
uh, socially acceptable to do it for a certain amount of time in a certain way. It should wash your hands because God said wash your hands. So if you take even 30 seconds to wash your hands or 10 seconds to wash your hands, I believe that if you do it in faith, God's going to make sure that nothing bad happens to you or anybody because of it. But when you do all the ceremonial thing, you're just doing it to be seen, and you're taking your now the traditions that were handed to you and putting them before the simplicity of just trusting that God said to do it for your good. So instead of just sticking with hands being washed, Jesus kind of steps it up a serious notch, in my opinion. And that is he goes, uh, he goes into talking about honoring your father and mother, which of course is one of the great commandments when it comes to the, uh, the culture of the time. And he says, you completely, you completely invalidate God's command, I'm, I'm reading in verse 9, in order to maintain your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whosoever speaks evil of his father and mother must be put to death. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift committed to the temple, you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You revoke God's word for your tradition that you have handed down, and you, and you do many other similar things. So he, he gives them a, a greater example, which I think in closing we'll kind of look at is this is that it's kind of an insult to God to think that anything he would command us to do would be to our detriment. Wouldn't you think? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Who, would, who would respect God's word if the only thing it was was him just trying to make you jump through an additional hoop for his entertainment? And that's almost what religion makes God look like, is that they, they start putting hoops and they say, if you love God, you'll jump through this hoop. If you love God, you'll jump through that hoop. And, it, and before you know it, you think of God only as the circus, you know, and the trained master who makes you jump through hoops, and you lose connection with him. The more hoops you have to jump through that people tell you you have to jump through, the less respect you have for God, because you've suddenly had to just see him as somebody you have to appease by jumping through their hoops. So he brings an example, he says, look, you've tried to take what was simple and an act of obedience and trust in God and turn it into something that is totally nullified by your traditions. He says, if I was going to ask you to take care of your father and mother, don't you think that I was using it as a means to both provide for them and you? If God says take care of your father and mother, don't you think he's using it as a means where he can both provide for you and them? That he's not expecting you to bear the responsibility of caring for someone that he laid on your doorstep? Yeah. Amen. Not that you're laying your parents on your doorstep, but in essence, you understand what I'm saying. He's made you responsible to provide for them, but who would he be to, to expect you to provide for them at your own cost while he's the one commanding you to do so? So the big picture is here, people lost confidence in God to provide for them. So in order for them to pr provide a way out, they would say, look, anything that I have that would benefit my parents is actually just going to be a gift to the temple. So they can't benefit from me. And lay that responsibility on someone else. I don't know who that responsibility would then fall upon. But the idea was they could lay that responsibility upon someone else. Let me tell you, whether it's doing the right thing as an employer or whatever your situation is, I'm going to encourage you that a lot of times it's going to cost us something to do things the right way, but it's always meant to be a provision for your future. Anything that you are called to do that costs you something now is only meant to be a means for God to provide for your future. Amen. So, let's think about those things in the week ahead. We'll see what things await us. How many are looking forward to being able to, uh, to see what God has awaiting for us? I like the way he 
changed that woman's life forever and made her whole, not just healed her. Because sometimes we go into a meeting and we're thinking, God, just heal me. God, just heal me. God, just heal me. And the funny thing is, God's got a plan of wholeness, not just healing. And that means that, sure, healing is a part of that. But God's got a bigger plan for wholeness in our lives. So we can get on with the abundance that God's given to us. He said, I am coming today, my life, have life. That's, that's one thing. And have it in abundance. Yeah. Because a lot of times we stop at new birth and we think, okay, that's it. I've got everything God has for me. And you're like, well, you do have everything God has for you over there. But if you want everything God has for you over here, you have to accept the abundance, the part with abundance. Amen. So, and that's that's a message that we, we can share all day long, every day, and know that God will prove himself the same faithful to provide abundance in the lives of others as he does for us. So, Father God, let's just pray. Father God, we just, throughout this this uh, study in the book of Mark, God, there are just so many good things that we, that we receive from you. And we ask God that, just like this woman, God, there are people in our lives that they are in a position where they're broken. They're, they're broke, <laughs> and they're broken, and they're needy, God. But we see them only as, as just a faceless mass. But God, when those multitudes around us are in the same place of need, God, you see that need. When somebody reaches out in faith, in whatever way they reach out to you in faith, you always make that connection. You always feel that as a personal touch. And then you respond. Thank you, God. You have recognized and responded and rewarded us. I ask God that you would help us to be sensitive. And let us be those vessels like you did for your disciples. To share the miracles. To share the miraculous provision. To share the miracle power of God. Just as you invited your disciples to. We today share that and ask you, God, to make us by your spirit more sensitive and ready to share that at will with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, um, if you wouldn't mind, we can take a few minutes just to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. I hear the coffees are perking.